live in the information age. Kicked off by the invention of the transistor in the mid-20th century, digital technology has since proliferated and radically altered the way almost everyone worldwide lives, works, and plays. Online, no matter what it is, what type of content, information is stored and manipulated as binary code, ones and zeros. Each one or zero is one bit. It takes eight bits to make one character, like the letter A or the number seven. Despite this minute size and aggregate, there is a ton of digital content now being generated. It's estimated that in 2025, the amount of digital information created globally every day will be 465 exabytes, an amount equal to the storage capacity of 210 million DVDs. Certainly all that data is not being burnt onto DVDs, so where does it go? Some of it goes to personal hard drives and on-site servers, and a lot of it goes to the cloud, centralized cloud servers maintained by corporations. It's big business and is growing fast. A couple of years ago, the cloud storage market was about 90 billion. Last year, it was about 110 billion. By the end of the decade, it's expected to be about 500 billion. Today, the biggest cloud service providers include the following. Amazon Web Services or AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, etc. They tend to use a pay-as-you-go model, X bytes of data for Y period of time with Z retrievability guarantees. To retain and attract more customers, they seek to excel in a number of attributes. Latency, the amount of time it takes between a user request and the server response, mostly influenced by geographical proximity. Throughput, the amount of data handled by the network at a given time, mostly influenced by bandwidth. Availability, the percent of time that the cloud is functioning correctly, also called uptime. Durability, the probability that data stored to the cloud is retrievable in one year, measured in nines, such as 10 nines of durability. To improve durability with much less overhead, data isn't simply replicated in entirety, but is sharded. Pieces are sent to various locations so that even if some of the pieces are lost, the content can be reconstructed. Today, just three corporations, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, and Microsoft Azure, account for two-thirds of the global cloud storage industry. Centralization can bring economies of scale. It can net the corporation bulk deals on hardware for manufacturers, the ability to land favorable offers when determining in what political jurisdiction to build a data center, and greater efficiency due to specialization of labor. But centralization can bring vulnerability in the form of data leaks or loss and hacker attacks and can be fragile. Consider just one month, December of 2021. AWS had three major outages, the last due to the loss of power at a single data center. And centralization brings with it surveillance and censorship concerns. These big corporations include not just individuals as customers, but government agencies, and they've been known to do them favors. In 2020, a documentary called Plandemic was making the rounds. After big tech platforms like YouTube and Facebook censored the content to comport to the narrative being pushed by DC, some folks uploaded the video to Google Drive, which relies on Google Cloud Platform. Made aware of this content that questioned the official narrative, the Google Cloud peeps deleted the content. The following year, AWS canceled the hosting of social network Parler after it disagreed with content posted by users. And let's not forget about this gym when Amazon, which of course uses AWS, deleted the book 1984 from customers' Kindles. In 2021, the largest cloud corporations crafted what they dubbed trusted cloud principles, ostensibly motivated to protect customer privacy. Their principle proactively notes the desire to partner with governments to resolve international conflicts of law that impede innovation, security, and privacy. But as governments are the biggest transgressors of law, innovation, security, and privacy, this is only window dressing, demonstrating the willingness of these corporations to click their heels when so ordered. The allegiances of these centralized cloud corporations and the censorship that they've engaged in has spurred some discussion, including this insight from Corny McSherry of the Electronic Freedom Foundation. When you engage in content moderation, you are inevitably oversensitive. You take down more content than is, quote, harmful. There is no reason to think that the situation would be any different at an infrastructure level. Might there be a better option than relying on these censorship-prone, centralized corporations? Options that are not just uncensorable, but possibly more robust and speedy? There may be decentralized storage. We'll delve into that next week. A two-parter? Dang. Mm. Now I'm for sure tuning in next week. How about y'all? I'll be there. That'll be interesting. Maybe we'll have to have a show that kind of dovetails with that. We'll have to see. Okay. 
here for the intro only. <laughs> nice. I for sure didn't know that Amazon had taken copies of the book 1984 out of people's drives. That is, that's too much. You can't make that up. Mikhail, how are you I today? Doing I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah? Splawick says, wow. Well, I say wow, too, because we are here today with uh, one of the strategists from the incubator, Mikhail, to speak about something that is pretty dang important to me anyway. Um, and that is a decentralized. Oh, I'm almost so sick of using that word because just because of how often it's abused, but a fiat to crypto exchange because there's the occasional sprinkling of this or that out there, but nothing robust or popular that I've seen. The last time there was a popular version, it was centralized, it was called localbitcoins.com. I was a big time user, thought it was awesome. And then, you know, five, six years ago, they started like taking away trade options and they just slowly took away more and more trade options until what was it guys? Do you remember like two years ago, they just said, we're closing our doors. Goodbye everyone. And, and then the market has been bereft since. So where did this idea come from for you, Mikhail? Was it that same thing or something else? Um, yeah. Um, the idea, uh, actually the project was, uh, picked up by me and also there is uh, another uh, developer in the Dash Incubator called Emmanuel, which uh, uh, really love to see this product uh, is going. Uh, so he told he told me about this project, about the possible of uh, building of decentralized exchange um, on top of Dash. And, uh, uh, and yeah, we are driving this product through together. Um, just to add a little bit to that, um, the project actually has been in the incubator for a long time, oh. um, predating, I think even Mikhail's, uh, involvement as a strategist. Um, and that was originally started. I don't know who started it particularly, but, um, Tim, um, Spectaprod was the strategist, uh, uh, that had that project originally. And then Tim's budget uh, went down to essentially zero. So he wasn't able to continue working on it. And so we needed to find a home for that project. Um, so Ash and I both discussed it, the pros and cons. And, and for various reasons, uh, we declined um, to pick up personally um, as one of our own projects. But um, Shenmick, Mikhail has has picked it up and I'm looking forward to see him, seeing if he can breathe new life into it. Sure, okay. sure. Exactly. And so everyone is clear what we're talking about. Okay, I'm sure you've heard the term DEX. What this is, we're not talking about, okay, so for example, we're not talking about the DEXs that live on top of a single network, you know, like um, what's the one with the unicorn or like the sushi swap where you can only trade tokens that live on top of a single network, right? Like fish coin, gigabyte swap, whatever, like, right? Okay, so we're not talking about what are essentially um, colored coins or on Ethereum, they'd be called, you know, ERC20 tokens, whatever. We're not talking about that. We're also not talking about a DEX that is cross-chain, right? Which in the case of Dash, we're most excited about uh, like Maya, where we can swap natively like chain to chain, it is not that. We are talking about an exchange where somebody who has rubles in their bank account or even rubles in their hand, a stack of them in their hand, wants to get their hands on some crypto. How on earth do they do it? That's the market that localbitcoins.com used to serve. So shall we bring up your slides, Mikhail? Sure, sure. Uh, let's get to it. Um, can you see that? Yes. So originally, uh, the concept is a concept is a uh, decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange where you can exchange fiat, um, which uh, uses echo chosen uh, by admin uh, through the best DAO. So what the problems do we have? Uh, the first uh, is that centralized exchanges like Binance, 
impactful or any others. Uh, they enforce some censorship rules. They can block access for different people, for example, for Russian people, for any other people, just uh, choosing randomly or not. And also they enforce to uh, abide the rules of the country that they registered uh, into. Uh, they also um, enforce to use uh, know your client and the money laundering clause uh, that required to make trades even for small trades. If you trade like 10 boxes, uh, 100, you know, uh, you have to give out your IDs and stuff like that. And the most important, they that they hold all the access to your funds, like uh, to exchange your Dash on the fiat, you have to load it up onto custodial exchange. And uh, yeah, that's uh, something uh, that is something uh, that, that you ha has to be done. Um, so what's the idea of local money concept? Um, Local money concept is a decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange of where you can run trades through the escrow using multi-sign uh, transactions to make trades. So how does it work? Uh, you want to trade uh, fiat dash for your fiat, uh, for example, for USD or rebels, and uh, you buyer and the seller um, they get registered uh, on the local money. Uh, then they create a ad escrow address that uh, all three parties uh, have access to. Uh, this is the buyer, the seller, and the ar arbitrator um, of the local money that uh, would be chosen by the Dash DAO. Uh, so uh, the money gets loaded up and then uh, the fiat uh, transactions uh, gets executed once the transaction is done uh, once the fiat is getting loaded up uh, onto a bank account for example or in cash uh, both parties uh, are chosen to uh, to approve uh, and confirm the trade uh, but uh, what if uh, one of the party uh, wanna scam you and just uh, doesn't want to approve you like uh, they accept the money, but uh, don't want to release uh, the money. The third party comes uh, into game. So, uh, so the arbiter, uh, the escrow admin, uh, that will be chosen by the voting in the Dash DAO, uh, have the access to choose where, which which part, uh, which part of this uh, transaction will. Uh, will be approved like uh, he can he will uh, get access to all the history of, of his of the trade like uh, both partners will be able to uh, to post the screenshots or stuff like that some details of the of the how, how the pay payment was going and then uh, he will choose uh, what party will, will will receive the money so uh, so how the multi sign transactions are basically working this is uh, this is the way where uh, uh, where we can have free private keys uh, holding uh, by the each party. But uh, in order to transaction to succeed uh, in the network, uh, two or three uh, parties uh, have to sign it uh, with their private keys. So we have free private keys, but uh, only one address. So the, uh, the money gets loaded up on this address, but in order to transfer it, uh, you will have to have the approval of the two parties of free. Yeah, and I wanna bring up here, if I may, that this um, escrow function, and granted localbitcoins.com had this too. So what Mikhail is talking about is also having this excellent escrow function that's that doesn't just address like, hey, how do we make trades safe between two people who are potentially thousands of miles from each other and don't trust each other, don't know each other. How can we make that work? But this escrow mechanism also addresses in-person trades for unbanked people or people who are doing cash trades. I bring this up because I've seen a comment in the Dash Discord at some point saying, oh my gosh, how could we ever 
ever sign on for in-person trades. That's so dangerous. That's so dangerous. Um, and this escrow model and the arbiter model where someone else ultimately has the say if there's a dispute as to whether the trade went well, um, that really adds a lot of protection. And I'll say, I remember back in the day um, reading trade posts for ca people who wanted to buy or sell cash with crypto. Some of them would say, hey, um, I I'll meet you in the lobby of the police station, right? So, I mean, it was like people set up secure trades, you know, surrounded by police with escrow on, on the other side of things. And so I just want to say, it seems like, it's, it's just a good tool. I'm, I'm glad you've included it. Please continue. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, fiat trades uh, will be available uh, to, to exchange, uh, to buy Dash or sell Dash. And uh, some other uh, crypto pairs will be available uh, to exchange, but, uh, but, they, but, but these trades will be available through atomic swaps, um, through the time-locked uh, contracts and stuff like that. So it's not only about uh, buying and selling Dash. Uh, you can also choose to exchange different uh, cryptocurrencies uh, on the platform, on this platform. Um, yeah. Um, so what is the plan? Uh, the plan is uh, to prepare, to, to, to do, to, to, so the first, what we need to do is to do a lot of researches. Uh, the first research is to how to, how can we we make um, this escrow uh, work? Um, we have to research how to do this uh, multi sign transaction. Uh, to do that, uh, we we plan to prepare a classical front end back end infrastructure where we deploy a front end and front end will be taking the back end. On the back end, we have an SQL. Uh, so this will so at, at this point. Uh, the application will look like a regular local Bitcoin sub local Bitcoin application, um, but uh, but at this point uh, we will try to make uh, these trustless uh, escrow transactions in the meaning that uh, only you have access to the fund and uh, this multi signature transactions. Uh, once we get this, uh, we can think of of migrating infrastructure to the decentralized way. What does it mean? That does mean that uh, anyone could just clone the code, uh, clone, clone uh, the repository, uh, download the source code on their computer, laptop, or mobile phone, and uh, and start making trades. Um, so at this point, uh, the application will be able to sync up to the network, and uh, once it's done, um, it will everything will will be done. Uh, in decentralized ways, uh, that means that uh, you don't have to have uh, to connect to any given uh, concrete uh, backend server or reach out uh, to to website which can be closed and da closed down uh, by the government by the you know it can be taken down by by the hoster by the by the owner of this uh, website. Um, so uh, there are several approaches how can we do it and we still uh, we're still searching the best way to do that uh, one one of the way is uh, uh, is to use dash platform probably uh, but since it's uh, not live yet in the testnet we can't really uh, rely on that yet um, what is the back end doing, um, Mikhail? What is the back end doing in this case? Uh, right now, back end, uh, right now, back end is used uh, to store the information uh, about the user, like login, uh, password, uh, hashed password, uh, the the orders, uh, all the info, chat info. Uh, but later, uh, we will. Uh, delegated uh, to the decentralized uh, databases. Is there so, is there business logic on the back end? Um, actual code that's that has right. to be run, I assume. Uh, yes. Uh, for the for the first stages, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, every logic will be in the back end. Uh, 
So if you did, if you did need to, if you did, or when you do want to move to a decentralized backend, uh, and if you planned on using Dash Platform for that, then presumably you would need some kind of code execution to do the business logic, uh, which would um, not be possible without uh, smart contracts or some other solution to run code on certain data. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so there are a few approaches. Uh, the first approach uh, is that uh, everything will be run on the client's device like uh, the client uh, can verify everything uh, with uh, integrated in the source code. So uh, for example, um, the person who could like to make trades, he will uh, download the front end and the back end, which will act uh, as a gateway between the decentralized database and, uh, and the code that verifying uh, the, the state uh that uh, is stored on, in the decentralized uh, database and he will connect via front end to his uh, local uh another approach is to integrate it uh, as a single application uh, but in 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 that case uh, uh the web uh, the web application would be harder to do because uh, uh, because uh, web browser doesn't allow you to do much things like you know the TCP connections are pretty li limited and uh, some protocols are, are not available and uh, for example uh, storage level is not so um, so powerful and stuff like that okay um yeah and um, after we mm, make this this uh, uh, infrastructure in decentralized way uh, we can then step on to implementing some different crypto pairs to exchange. Uh, it will uh, done. It will be done via atomic swaps, uh, which can be done via uh, time locked contracts. Uh, so you can exchange Dash on Ethereum, on USDT, and any other cryptocurrencies. Okay, let let's pause a moment on that point that you just made. So you are saying that you'd like the application to, it sounds like, is it Dash native? Like the only way or the only crypto that anyone can buy in their first step in the application is Dash. Yes. And then only afterward can Dash be swapped to other currencies. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know that much about atomic swaps, except that I've just always thought they sounded cool like very cool, but for whatever reason, and I'm sure I don't need to tell either of you or anybody else this, atomic swaps have not taken off. I mean, am I right? Like I haven't seen them take off nearly to the extent that, for example, uh, like automated market makers have. So are we just like headed for another black hole like all these other people who have dumped resources into atomic swaps or is it different for us? And if, if, if so, why? Well, um... Well, they work. Uh, at least what, what I can say is um, that uh, scheme is working, that uh, atomic swaps has exist. I don't know how much volume uh, does they have, but uh, but it's possible to do. And uh, uh, like it's a way it's a way to do to exchange to Dash on other <laughs> cryptocurrencies uh, trustless. So uh, so. Because you asked, maybe I'll, I'll give some of my understanding of atomic swaps and, and my concerns. Um, the term atomic is more or less a database, a database term. Um, in databases, you have what are called atomic tr transactions, where one part of a transaction only happens if the whole part of the transaction happens. So you can you can imagine one part of the transaction being, um, I'm going to lock up my my coins and another part of the transaction could be um, somebody else is going to lock up their coins and another part of the transaction would be those coins get swapped or something like that so there sometimes there are multiple steps in a transaction atomic means the whole thing either completes or none of it completes you can't have a situation where half of the transaction happened like i locked my coins or i sent my coins to this place but the other half of the transaction didn't happen. That's just the etymology of the term atomic transactions. Um, and atomic transactions in this 
and that and that's a like I said, that's a database general database um, thing, not just a, a blockchain thing. Um, in this case, you know, you you definitely want those transactions to be atomic when you're doing exchanges from one person to another. I want to have assurance that I'm if I send my dash somewhere, then the Bitcoin that I wanted is also going to come as part of that transaction or the whole thing gets canceled. So that's obvious, um, uh, nice user benefit. Um, the reason why I think that they have not succeeded very well is that they're basically predicated on the idea that uh, of an order book where I want exactly $1,000 worth of Bitcoin and I need somebody that also wants exactly $1,000 worth of Dash on the other side of my trade because I'm trading with a specific person, not necessarily with a protocol. And I could be wrong with that, but that's my understanding of primitive atomic transactions. And that's one of the reasons why they haven't taken off is because you just need, uh, it's very difficult to find somebody with that, what, what economists would call a double coincidence of needs. Um, and so it's, it's not there. The liquidity is not there to use another dumb term. I, I don't like it, but, um, there's just not it's not very likely that you'll find somebody in that scenario and that's why automated market makers have been more successful because now you're trading against a protocol of a, of a whole pool of funds that um, are managed by liquidity providers and so it's mostly like a market um, meeting a market need rather than a techno it's not a technological problem like um, Mikhail was saying atomic swaps are more or less a solved problem technologically they don't necessarily solve the problem in the marketplace, um, at least not yet. And that could also change. So that's one of my concerns with this project um, is um, just that whole idea. And why has, why has, for example, BISC not taken off? Because the, the problem, the market problem that I just described exists in the fiat world as well, not just the atomics transaction uh, you need to find somebody that has a thousand dollars of fiat that you want for your thousand dollars of dash. So that that problem is not a technological problem. It's a market problem. It's also a problem of um, having enough, like being the dominant market player in an industry. And that's a big, big challenge. So I obviously hope that this project succeeds, but those are kind of my concerns with it. Um, and I think that Mikhail has a better, a better idea of what the demand for this would be. Might might be like in the Russian community, for example. Um, Splawik says, "Can this be done on the Maya Dex as part of local money?" Huh, yeah, good question. So um, local money, just so everybody is clear, I, I think um, I, th that could mean two different things because there is a local money project in the Maya community that uh, actually I think it's in the Kajira community, which is one of the other coins on the Maya uh, decks. And they're building a, pro <laughs> a project that's very similar. It also has the exact same name called Local Money. And um, so that, that would be, in my opinion, a, a competitor. Um, so I don't know what that, if that question was referring to, maybe Splawik can, can uh, chime in and, and verify, was that referring to this, Local money, can somebody bring up the question again? And then I'll just uh, shut up and let Mikhail answer this question. Yeah, I think uh, the question was, uh, uh, maybe it's a good idea to implement the Maya straight into the local money. Is that uh, his question? Like to do exchange between uh, cryptocurrencies? Mm. Well, if so, uh, I was thinking about that, but, uh, mm, but I have to research it uh, as well, so. Uh, it's. Uh, I think it should be possible uh, to do that, but uh, I haven't uh, checked this out yet. Okay, Splawik just made a comment saying that local monies Michael wants to build. So I, I don't know. Maybe the, I think he meant. This oh, one. okay. I was gonna say maybe there's a contact for you, Mikhail. <laughs> it just so happens his name is Michael. Okay. <laughs> Um, can we talk about BISC for a moment? I'm glad you brought that up, Ryan, because it is, as you said, in a lot of ways, fairly similar to what we're talking about here. And um, I don't know about the function or the traffic that BISC is or is not seeing to this day. 
Um, somebody please chime in if you know that. But I do, I did try to become a BISC user oh, four or five years ago or whatever. Um, I actually interviewed the guy like the week after he launched it back when it was called BitSquare. And I guess that wasn't a good name. It was already in use somewhere else and he didn't know. But uh, yeah, long story short, BISC was a client you had to download to your desktop and it needed to be left running in order for trades to happen. And one side of every trade always had to be in Bitcoin, it didn't support any other coins. And then the there fiat was a small option, period. I think there was a small period where they actually did support Dash. Really? Yeah, I think so. Um, oh. At least they were talking about it because I was following the project very closely and I heard either plans or actually it was working. And I do believe it was actually working. But anyway, keep going. My stars. OK, uh, well, the the fiat options were similar to what was available on local bitcoins.com, you know, so it was like a, um, an ACH transfer, um, a did they actually support cash deposits at a bank branch? I don't yes. know. Yes. Did they? OK, yeah, so that was cool. Um, I don't know if they supported in-person meetups for people who happen to be in the same area. Um, and then there were, yeah, and, and then I, I don't know if they just supported gift cards or whatever, like, hey, send me your gift card for this store. Uh, I imagine they supported PayPal, et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. I might have to walk that back just a little bit. Sorry, I am I may be getting my experiences mixed up with, 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 uh, with local Bitcoins and things like that. So oh, I'm not 100% sure that they did support bank transfers, but keep going. Okay, yeah. Well, anyway, um, yeah, I just remember I downloaded the client. I was ready to make a trade. I was feeling excited. And um, kind of just like you mentioned, Ryan, there seems to be, um, well, I guess I, it just, it didn't support the trade I was looking for. But anyway, um, la la la, no more of my experiences. I just want us to discuss if we might, um, why didn't BISC take off? And can we prevent ourselves from going down that same path? Um, I, I kind of already gave my opinion on that. I, I don't think, uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult. Is it possible that BISC did not take off because of Bitcoin fees? Or is that not? I think, uh, no, I think there is uh, also another reason is that uh, uh, it's hard to adopt because uh, uh, because you have to download the client on your laptop and uh, with the local money is uh, we we go to allow you to use it on your mobile phone to uh, to use it from your web browser so that uh, it targets uh, more more people, more audience uh, to use uh, the local money. Mm, yeah, that's a significant issue, I think. That, yeah. that that was one of the big problems with BISC. Yeah, I remember people saying that that was another reason they thought that um, this is not that related, but Open Bazaar, why they thought that that didn't go anywhere because you, again, you had to keep basically acting as a node all the time. Mm -hmm. So, so, so Mikhail, do you just hope that it's possible that no one has to act as a node in this case, or you know it's possible. And and if so, why has no one done this yet? <laughs> yeah, what are the trade-offs? Because they, they they were obviously requiring that you download the software to your own machine so that there was more or less no middleman. So what, what are the trade-offs to the solution that you proposed? Um, uh, the proposed, uh, the, the trade-offs is, uh, is in, uh, the first, uh, the, the BISC uh, have you, you have to download the client uh, in the local money. Uh, you can you can have an application on your mobile phone. You can have a, uh, just you can visit the, uh, via your browser. So the trade-offs uh, between um, usability and uh, and and uh, that. Uh, um, like, yeah, yeah, uh, the convenience uh, 
uh, of using the application. Um, yeah, uh, the project, uh, um, like uh, the, the project uh, that we're rigging, uh, uh, is surely possible. Like it's it's uh, it's I know how how to do this, uh, so that's why why we are building it. And uh, um, maybe it, maybe it was just maybe it boiled down to they didn't have anywhere to store data in a decentralized way, and their their solution to that was storing the data on everybody's node. Um, but maybe that's exactly what Dash Platform solves. I happen to think that you know it might be tricky to solve that problem without um, without some kind of execution engine on the back end. Um, but I think it's also a solvable problem. Uh, maybe maybe you could do that on the front end. Actually, something that I've, I've wondered about for a long time, whether we actually ever need um, execution on the back end on Dash Platform. So I, I do think it's solvable. The other, the other issue, the other um, challenge that I, I think you will have with this is just the, the amount of time that it might take and resources. Do you think with your current budget that, that this is something that you can have a successful project with, with your current budget? We will see. We will see. I think it's doable. I don't think that will take uh, that much amount, but uh, with my budget, uh, we, we will see how, how it goes. Uh, if it will take really a lot of efforts, uh, we will we will think about that. Maybe redesign or or, or do something about this. At least um, we will posting the results of this project, and we will we will be able to see. We all will be able to see. Mm -hmm whether uh, this is uh, a good project or not. Yeah. And so along those lines, if, if I had any kind of recommendation or, or advice, I would say focus on just one feature, the, the most, the one th feature that, that you're trying to solve the most, which might be fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat, and maybe uh, just atomic swaps or something that you leave to other projects um, until uh, you have more budget to work with. Because my experience with incubator in general is that we are spread very thin and my mistakes have probably mostly boiled down to too many projects not enough developers to make many of them successful um, and so that's why i've actually pivoted to being focusing more on one two or three projects at uh, three projects max um, that I feel comfortable with taking on, which is why I didn't take this project on, um, because projects just need a lot of focus in order to be successful. So yeah, if, if you could just you know solve the one problem that you want um, and do it well, I think this problem, this project could succeed. Yeah, and I want to right. follow up that comment with, um, I'm glad that you have taken on something so ambitious, Mikhail, because it seems like the other stuff that you took on over the past year or whatever is more or less under control or fixed or like fine, <laughs> I guess I'll say. Um, and so, you know, now that those things are like, hey, all the fires are put out, um, I... I'm glad that you've seen that you have the bandwidth for something new and it seems fairly ambitious. Um, let's read TL's comment. Does the minimum viable product have to include a th the third party escrow? Could it just include connecting two parties together so that the in-person meetup could happen like Amanda described? Uh, yes, the MVP will include the escrow as the minimum viable product feature. So yeah, that's the first thing uh, that we want to make. Sorry, you said you said that um, having escrow is part of the minimum viable project. Well, that's the first. Yes, uh, that's the third. Uh, sorry, that's the first thing uh, that we want to make done. Can we talk a little bit more about th how that third-party escrow works? Then you you said that. Uh, oh, no, sorry. I mean, uh, multi-sign signature and not, not third-party. That uh, multi. Uh, um, oh, just like two. a two or two, where if one of the two parties yeah. disagrees, the funds get returned, and that's yeah. that's without an escrow agent. Yes, 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 exactly. So I yeah. Yeah. Well, now yeah. that I think about it, 
what is the point of having a third party escrow agent if just one dissatisfied party can oh yeah because uh, yeah because that actually involves a good deal of trust because maybe if we yeah. if we trade in person and the trade goes well but then i dishonestly just be like nope i was unhappy with the trade and then i get i get both i keep my crypto that i traded for and i keep the right am i am i making sense well, the, uh, I think what the problem is, is it's very difficult to make a it's very difficult to make an atomic transaction in the fiat world, because, for example, if 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 I'm on the fiat side, let's say that you and I are doing a, a trade, Amanda, and I you want my fiat, you want my dollars and I want your crypto. Mm -hmm. And let's say that I'm going to do that through. Um, through my banking app or something or something that's not something that's reversible is what I'm trying to get at. Like I, I send you fiat in a way that's reversible. Yeah. Um, and, but you send me the crypto, which is irreversible. That's, right. that's tricky okay. because I can reverse my transaction and keep the crypto. But, um, yes, go ahead and Mikhail. Um, I think you had something to say about that. Um, yeah. So, the idea is to make it trustless so that uh, you don't have to trust on third party. So that's that's why we're building this uh, two or three uh, multi-signature transactions as part of the escrow. So that was mm -hmm. um, I'll ask this viewer question and then I have one more of my own. Herman wants to know, would this be all based on platform using Dash usernames for those transactions? Uh, not not explicitly like uh, uh, we, we haven't uh, think we haven't thought uh, about this yet so uh, so not probably exactly. not initially at least uh, yes yes yeah. okay I have a question for you Mikhail are you would you use this application yeah, of course I would like to add some rebels uh, trading pairs <laughs> so like would you okay yeah, I, I guess I just ask because um, I can only imagine that as a developer, how challenging it would be to build something that I didn't intend to use myself without a ton of market research first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, actually, all of my products that, that I uh, do in the Dash Incubator, uh, almost all, maybe, yeah, all of the products uh, I usually uh, use myself. Like everything that, that they do. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I know that you had said, Mikhail, that you want to hear more from people about, I don't know, what they want or what they're concerned about or whatever. And so I imagine if anyone watching this not live wants to reach out to Mikhail, um, you know what his contact information is. It's in the description section. And absent uh, any final comments, I think that will be it for us today. Yeah? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's good for me. Okay, good. Well, we look forward to uh, getting an update about this project, I hope sooner than later, Mikhail. And um, yeah, Godspeed. We'll see everyone next week. All right. Bye. For the second half of the newsreel. <laughs>